is we're going to take it from uh, beginning to end of Node.js. Um, so I'm just going to go through the exercises that we have uh, in 10.1 to 10.3. I'm going to go through random ones uh, depending on which ones fulfill uh, what what constitutes you know beginning to end. Uh, and a lot of them are re redundant or built upon one another, so we should be able to get through these pretty quickly, actually. Um, so if you guys have questions, again, just uh, paste them on the side or feel free to uh, jump in. If I'm saying like, hey, does anyone have questions? Uh, I'll wait a few seconds. Um, if you aren't fast enough, then you can just type something in like yes, and then I'll wait. Uh, other than that, does anyone have any questions before I start? Yeah, Omar, I had, I had questions about uh, about the reading and writing of... Yes, of yes, you did. Okay, uh, sorry about that. I completely forgot. Thank you for reminding me. So um, you were asking questions about reading, writing, and appending files, correct? Yeah, and like the relevance, because we're starting to do more dynamic things now, I'm assuming. So. Yeah, so the relevance of command line applications and reading, writing to, and appending files... Uh, is important if you're, again, not when you're using a server with Node.js, but when you are creating these command line applications um, for usage on, uh, on local machines. So let's say that you created a command line application, um, just be a, you know, a, a JavaScript file, uh, a simple one that, that basically you know, uh, took information from an existing file, convert it to a different format, and then output it to somewhere else. That would be uh, something that could be really useful. Now, it seems like like what we've done up to this point um, would be irrelevant to web development, right? Because everything was very local. Um, but we're starting to get used to the Node environment and how Node works. And from there, we're going to jump into using the web application that's uh, sorry, the web application framework built into Node.js called express.js um, starting on Monday, which is tomorrow. Um, and you're going to use a lot of the same uh, commands and a lot of the, the same concepts we've learned, um, but not a lot of the same exact uh, technology. So we've learned a lot of uh, methods on the module, which is FS. So the FS module has a lot of local system uh, capabilities like read files, writing files, appending files, and things like that. So um, that will be uh, more of like a training exercise or more of a, something that can be utilized in, in real life, but um, it's less relevant for web development, per se. Uh, that said, um, yeah, so it is a very common tech interview uh, problem, uh, and it's something that a lot of uh, computer science majors uh, end up doing because it it teaches you a lot of basic input output. Uh, so especially if you guys work with um, Java or like statically typed languages or compiled languages in general, um, you have a lot of uh, programs that allow you to do things like that, uh, especially from like a simple GUI. Um, so uh, the read file module, if we go to, let's open this up. And let me share my screen as well. So, Everyone see my screen? Yeah, we can. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into CD02, and let's just look for one that has the read file. And I believe this one does. Yeah, this one does. OK, so if we have. 0 to write file. So this one, uh, this is one activity that, and let me just actually open up everything. So uh, all of you guys should have these uh, solutions already. Uh, if you guys don't, um, just post in the chat room and uh, we can have one of my students just uh, zip you guys uh, all the solved activities uh, so you can follow through. Does anyone not have the activities for 10.1 to 10.3? I'll wait a few seconds. Uh, UT Houston does not. 
Uh, did you guys finish 10.1 to 10.3? Uh, what are you guys at right now? Oh, you guys are on week six. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is going to be more of a review for 10.1 uh, to 10.3. Uh, so I don't want to send out those activities because uh, it might help you uh, cheat, in cheat in class. Um, but this will help you get ahead of... Uh, the, the program and, and really uh, help you catch up. So this is, uh, I thought we were all running concurrently at the same pace, but I guess uh, because of holidays and things, uh, other groups might be falling behind. But that shouldn't be too much of an issue. We'll try and take it step by step. So uh, for read file uh, and write file, okay. Oh, okay, okay. Got it. Yeah, so this one is the, uh, I'm doing the January class. So they're in week 10 right now. Okay, no worries. I think it's January, February, same thing. Okay. So the write.js, um, if you take a look at the file, um, this is a module, uh, the FS module is built into Node.js. And notice that um, going back onto how requiring works, this is actually called the common JS uh, method of importing uh, different uh, elements into uh, Node.js. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned to the UCLA class yet is that um, in the, well, actually currently, uh, because of uh, ES6, uh, a new way of doing it, which is just the same, it's it's just syntactic sugar, um, but with ES6, it's actually using import, uh, which is very similar to how statically typed languages and languages like, uh, and other non-statically typed languages like Python work, um, where you have uh, the packages just being imported, and it's just a different syntax. So instead of seeing this var fs equals require fs, you're going to see something that says import. Uh, and I want you guys to get confused because it's going to be the exact same thing. Okay. So what we're doing is uh, we, have avail we have available to us all of the different modules that exist within Node, um, but we don't uh, require them all at once. Now, uh, can you guys tell me why we don't require them all at once? Why do we only require them when we need them? Right, because we might only need a few. So why, so if we only need a few for having a fast web application, exactly. So um, we may only need a few functionally, but uh, our code is a lot about efficiency, um, especially when it comes to uh, web applications, right? Because the end user ends up being very impatient, right? Anytime you guys go to web applications and you see them running slowly, you're gonna be like, oh, you know, maybe after like, you know, one or two seconds, you're gone. Um, unless it's like, you know, something like you really want to go to like a, a Comic-Con page or something like that, or you want to see like the latest like Rick and Morty episode. Uh, if, it's, if it's something that you're not really invested into, you're probably not going to take too much time to uh, stay on the application you're going to leave. And there's some really good uh, statistics out there about this. Um, and I suggest you guys take a look at those. So we only require things when you need them. And this gives us a very nice modular format. And it makes Node... Uh, that much uh, faster. So uh, Node uses this common JS format for requiring our, uh, our different modules, but we can use the ES6 format, which uh, allows us to import them. So once we have this uh, module stored in a variable, what we can do from here is start using the methods available to us in that module. So one of the methods, if we go to the nodejs.org, vegan B12 foods, Pretty much the same thing as Node.js. This is how you can tell that we're from UCLA. Um, let's see, where's the documentation? Here we go, docs. API reference documentation. 
And if I go to, let's see, where's FS? File system. And this is actually a long way of going about it. I just wanted to show you guys the site. Uh, if you go to nodejs.org, um, it actually shows you uh, where you can install it. Uh, and it's, it's fairly easy to use, actually. Um, but notice that it has all these different methods available on the, uh, on the file system. So uh, one of the ones that we're using right now is the write file. So write file allows us to, and all of write file is just between here. So notice that uh, over here it might be a little confusing. It's like, okay, file, I can you know, pass a string, buffer, or integer. Uh, data, I can pass string, buffer, integer, or array, options, objects, string, blah, blah, blah. And you might be confused and it's like, what does all this do? Okay, so right now we can just ignore this um, and let's just take a look at, at the description. So asynchronously writes data to a file, replacing the file if it already exists. Now, data can be a string or a buffer. So um, don't worry about the buffer. Uh, we're not going to cover buffers uh, just because that's a little bit more than what we need to know right now. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. UTF-8 is the default encoding option. That is something that I want you guys to know. Uh, so the character sets that we use are in UTF-8. So when you see that, it's like, Oh, that's a standard character set um, in any string character that we're going to use, right? Unless you're like in a different country and you're using like you know different um, sets of characters, or you're like you know like in Japan or China, and you know, need to have different characters. We're just we're, we're just going to use UTF-8, uh, and we're just going to go straight to this example. So notice that it says fs.write file, and for me, the easiest way to go through how to use something is just to take a look at the context of the uh, of the application's usage. So in this case, the way that this method is being used shows me that this message.txt is going to be the file that I'm going to pass in. And based on the description, it says asynchronously writes data to a file. So I'm assuming that this is the file. If it already exists, it's going to replace the entire file. So um, UCLA students, you guys were using uh, Firebase, very similar to Firebase, or just replace everything in there um, if it already exists. So that is very important. It kind of just like nukes everything and replaces it uh, every time you use write file. Um, and that could be important. Like let's say you're doing like stock portfolio stuff or um, maybe you know, re you're replacing reports. You don't want to append to a report. You want to completely replace that report. Every time a new report comes in, that report comes in, you replace everything and you output it again. Did I lose anybody? No? Okay. Still here. Um, the second argument being passed to this method uh, is the text that's actually going to go inside of this file. So notice that the data is a second argument. It has options and everything. It might be a little bit confusing. But essentially, you're just passing in information uh, that's going to be now contained inside this file. Uh, Notice that the third argument is going to be a callback function. So uh, the way I have my students remember callbacks is Gwen Stefani. So can anyone tell me the Gwen Stefani reference? It sounds really stupid, but it helps. <laughs> Hollerback girl, thank you. Thank you, Jared. Uh, yes, so... Hollerback girl uh, will help you remember, oh, callbacks, so Gwen Stefani. Um, so a callback function, uh, in this case, uh, will execute, uh, no, not, <laughs> not bananas. So a callback function will only execute once a process is finished, meaning that this process over here needs to finish before this callback uh, function is executed. So this callback function, again, will only execute once this is run. So what this does is again, asynchronously, so asynchronously, you guys have already worked with Ajax. So UT Houston, you guys have worked with uh, Ajax by now, right? I think week six was Ajax. No? 
Did you guys just start week six, or are you guys uh, finishing week six? Starting this week. Okay. So actually, this could be a, a really good segue into uh, asynchronicity because you guys are going to be starting it. So you guys are going to be working with something called asynchronous calls. Uh, these are calls that are going to be made where you you execute uh, a function, like say, uh, or let's let's say this method. Um, and with AJAX calls, it's going to be very similar in this regard. And what happens is this this function will execute, and then the web API will get called and start a process to then uh, asynchronously, meaning it doesn't wait on this to finish, to then uh, go, sorry, let me explain that again. <laughs> so you're gonna have functions executing one after another. For instance, let's say that you have something like this. Uh, console.log, meow, console.log, gato, these are synchronous things. They happen one after another. With an asynchronous call, if I did this, watch what happens when I try and execute this write.js file. So I'm going to go into 0, 2. And to execute any node, uh, node application. So if I'm using node to execute uh, a file on the command line, I just type in node and I type in the name of the file, write.js. And hit enter. And notice that meow, then gato, and then movies.txt was updated, uh, gets executed. However, it looks like, the based on the context of the application, that console.log meow should have run, and then this should have been printed and then Gato should have been printed. But instead, you have meow, then Gato, and then movies.txt. So think about why that might happen. So take a couple minutes and, and think about that. Talk to each other, uh, try and explain it to one another. And UCLA students, uh, you can help out if they're getting stuck. You guys can unmute, by the way. Yeah, I'll step away just so you can just can talk and whatever. <laughs> now this is my first time at. No, this is my first exposure, so. Well, the asynchronous part is pretty much, well, you we see it elsewhere. Some things happen before other things. And I would guess that because it's writing to disk, that's going to be sh sh slower than other things. So the log gato even though it was um, after that part of the code, mm -hmm. uh, it didn't involve any writing to the disk. So it was faster. <laughs> I think that's what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we've done like HTML, CSS, Bootstrap, and we're in JavaScript right now. So everything I've seen pretty much goes from top to bottom. So this is kind of new to me. Yeah, right. Um, that's, that's the trick with the async. It's hard to get used to, I think. <laughs> you all done APIs? No. No, not yet. Not yet. This is very, it's a very similar concept which is, I guess, good exposure. Okay. So, 
Can anyone give me a good explanation of asynchronicity or asynchronous function calls? Let's see, I have the chat open. Come on, UCLA students. You guys are going over this. So it could be considered files loading independently of one another, but it's actually, let's see, lots of things can be in the process, don't want to block things, yeah. So power user, what did you put that explanation above? Okay, so you just put it over here, okay. So yeah, uh, essentially lots of things can be in the process, you don't want to block things. Uh, set of events or activities whose relative temporal ordering is indeterminate because too many things are going on at once. Hence, an asynchronous event is one you don't want, want to expect. A little bit more complicated than uh, what I wanted, but yes. Uh, essentially, it's a way to uh, execute things without having to wait on other things. You can load uh, and you can call multiple things. You can get requests uh, uh, concurrently without having them to wait on one another, right? So... This is how Google Images works, right? So if you load up, um, I don't know, if you look for cats or dogs or whatever you want online, right? Um, then what happens is uh, if you go to Google Images and do this, notice that the images actually load up pretty fast because we have fast internet connections. But if you want on like a slower computer, like at a library or something, you notice that um, the images don't actually load uh, one after the other they'll load asynchronous to one another. So these are asynchronous calls being made and they load whenever they come back, right? And this makes it a lot better of an experience because you actually get some information back uh, rather than no information back. And these calls are not blocking one another. So you get a lot more information uh, without having everything uh, blocking one another. Uh, so the way that Node.js works is it's actually all built or most of it is built on uh, this asynchronous nature. Now, there are ways to make synchronous calls. So if you did uh, write file sync, there's read file sync, then you can make it such that you have to execute, or you have to finish executing this call before it calls Gato. So if you go to the documentation and you go to fs.write file sync, then it forces you to do that. But we don't actually wanna do that. We actually wanna use the asynchronous nature uh, that's built into Node.js to uh, to make everything work. Um, okay, so and just because something has a callback doesn't necessarily make it uh, asynchronous. Um, and a callback function again is just a function that runs um, after uh, a process is done executing. Now in this case. Uh, you can assume most of the time when you're running into callback functions that they're going to be part of an asynchronous call, but that's just Node.js, right? But again, it's not uh, necessarily like 100%. Any questions so far? So UCLA students, uh, students this should all be a uh, review for UT Houston. Uh, other schools might not be. Yeah, hello? Yes. Okay, um, so is require, require is a method that's available to us in Node? Require allows us to, it's actually based on a common JS uh, architecture that allows us to import modules uh, from wherever, but in this case, it's coming from Node.js. Okay, so when we write fs.write file, we're saying access that Node module? Correct. And then, and then dot write file okay correct and and dot write file is is a method of node.js or or just fs it's a method of fs which is part of node okay good question any other questions all right uh, so yes. Mark, does, does this relate to sorry this is jumping the gun a little bit mm -hmm. for the Houston people, but like the weather, the weather module that we were mm -hmm. using, for example, 
it's the same thing as using that, except using a, a local Node.js module, right? Um, so you mean using... Oh, yes, 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 yes. I see what you mean. Yeah, so a... Uh, so what Jared is referring to is the weather uh, module, which we installed in 10.3, uh, was something that was an external node package. And we did have to install that uh, before we could require it um, and it does work in the same asynchronous nature uh, and it does require us to do the the same uh, step of requiring that module but we just have the additional step of having to uh, to load an external module onto our application first before we use it but it's a very simple process and we're gonna get into that today good questions any other questions No? All right. So if I execute this um, and I write movies.txt and the second argument being exception diehard, based on our documentation here, it asynchronously writes data to a file, replacing the file if it already exists. Data can be a string or buffer. So the file is the first argument, data is the second, callback is third. So let's get rid of these console.log meows. This is just to show the asynchronous nature uh, of this call over here. Um, and notice that we also have this error. So in Node, uh, our callbacks are all error first, meaning that we have access to the errors that come back if there are any, and they're the first arguments being uh, implicitly passed into the callback function uh, from the uh, API call. So in this case, uh, the web API uh, callback will then make a call. Well, this actually is not a web API call. This is just a uh, local call to the FS. So this is going to return an error uh, callback. Um, and if it has any information in there, so if error is equal to true, again, uh, if you just say if error and you don't pass it uh, anything else, it assumes that this is what you mean. So this is just a shortcut for if error is equal to true. Uh, then what happens is you can then return console.log uh, and then uh, log the error. Uh, if anything happened uh, to mess up during this uh, write file process, um, if that does not happen, then you just execute this over here. Notice that we did this return so that this would never uh, get executed. Uh, can you guys tell me uh, if, if I have a function and I call a return on anything, can I execute anything after return? Exactly, you cannot, right? Uh, so return, anything after that is essentially moot. So if you do return, this is essentially the same thing as doing an if-else statement. Um, so error is a boolean. Well, error itself is not a boolean, but um, this will check to see if error is true. Uh, and error will return a whole bunch of different things with it. So um, you can actually access different parts of the error, like the message and things like that. Um, so it does seem like it's a little bit weird. It's like, well, you, you know, if error is being returned and if you can check whether or not it's true, then it seems like it's just a boolean, but it can return much more information within that as well. By default, you can access the error and just see if it's true or false. Meaning, does it exist? Okay, uh, so if we take a look at, if, is error empty if good return? Oh, meaning that, um, yes, so error should be false. So let's check the error. So if we do console.log and we do error and it returns null. So uh, if it is present, uh, then we essentially is just checking to see if it exists meaning that it has information inside. So essentially like if error equals true, it means like there's something inside of it. Um, if 
it doesn't return uh, with something inside of it, then it'll just be set to null. Uh, and this is also because uh, null is a falsy value. Uh, so if you if you did like you know uh, if something is equal to null, it's the same thing as saying like if it's equal to false. And that's a little bit more complicated, but um, there's some other falsy values like zero and undefined. Error be a string. Uh, if there is an error, it would be returned. I believe it's returned as an error object when it comes from uh, right file because I can do error.message. So you're able to then extract information from the error object. So there's different parts of error that you can actually return. Oh, that's true. Uh, hmm. I don't know if I can. What's an invalid file, file name? What's like blah 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 blah? Let's see. Because I I don't know if it cares to do a data validation on this type of file. So let's see. Yeah, it doesn't really care. <laughs> Apparently, there's a new type of uh, file type. So if you did do like a console.log on uh, error, then uh, you could actually access different parts of the object, uh, like error.message is one of them. Um, most of the time I just use the message because it will give me the exact information that I want out of it. Um, uh, I think by default, if you just do error, it will give you back a stack trace. I'll, I'll post up the, uh, the link to this uh, afterwards. So a stack trace uh, can be good for determining like you know where the error is and what other things it's breaking. Uh, so if you guys work with you know other languages before, stack traces are, are pretty easy to follow. It just follows like you know um, where on the stack uh, the error occurred and then what other things like you know uh, led to it. Uh, and then of course on top would be the specific error. Well, JavaScript again, it can be very difficult to actually determine like what the error is. So I would also suggest um, always using a, uh, well, if you're trying to execute something that could run into errors, uh, like, you know, if it's based on user input, in this case, this isn't user input, right? Um, I'm explicitly giving it movies.txt. However, if I'm gaining user input based on, you know, command line arguments, then what I would do is do a try catch block. And a try catch block, uh, the error statement is, um, much more accessible, uh, so um, and sorry, much more uh, specific, and it can tell you like, oh, okay, find uh, where the error is exactly uh, based on that catch block. So it becomes much more um, usable in that case. Sorry, that was went way too down the rabbit hole with that one, but uh, we'll try and get back on track. All right. Wait, what? Okay, hold on. Let me move this. So movies.txt is already created. It will replace everything inside, and if not, it will create the file and place that text in it. Uh, actually, it will replace the whole file itself uh, and uh, everything inside of it as well. So let's see. Replacing the file if it already exists. If it doesn't exist, then it will create it. So it nukes the whole thing. All right. So read file is pretty much the same thing. Uh, the only thing is, uh, the only difference is uh, we pass it the, um, how we want to read it in terms of character set. So if you go to, zero three read file, and assume that we already created this movies.txt. Um, like, I, I taught my students thing like Martha Stewart, where she's like, oh, okay, like, we're going to put this in the oven for, like, 20 minutes, uh, and then I'm going to go to jail. And, uh, and then she already has something ready, right, that's already come out of the, out of the microwave or out of the fucking whatever it is, whatever it is the, uh, the oven or whatever, the, the crock pot or something, that's ready to go, right? So this is what we did here. We set up everything. So we have this movies.txt right here on the bottom, uh, and we're just going to read from it. So we're going to do node, read.js. 
And it doesn't make sense to just see the output. Let's take a look at the file itself. So if you take a look at read.js, we're reading the movies.txt, uh, but we're also passing the second argument being uh, the character set. Uh, oh yeah, another difference <clears throat> is that the, the callback function also returns the data in this case. So uh, each method is written differently. Uh, these are custom methods that are built by uh, you know, the Node.js team uh, so each one, you have to take a look at the documentation, see what it returns, what it does. In this case, it will return data. Uh, we can then print the contents of data, so display it uh, as a string. Actually, let me just do type of, just to make sure if it's that it's not a buffer. I don't want to do misinformation. Node read.js string. Yep. Anytime you guys want to see the data type of whatever uh, is being returned or whatever data type you're looking at, just do type of, uh, and it'll tell you the, uh, the data type of uh, that piece of data. I'm using data too much. Data. In case you guys were on Reddit for April Fools, uh, that was also all over the place for uh, the subreddit, data is beautiful. So data. All right, so we have, we have this thing. I'm not going to say it again. Uh, from here, what we did was we converted to an array uh, based on wherever there uh, exists a comma. And uh, we then save that, or we reference it into a variable called data r. Uh, so data array, and then we console.log that again. So if we take a look at what we see here, notice that we have an array of two strings now. And notice that there's a space here uh, because of movies.txt having that space over here. So we split this string on this comma and then we then got this space out of it as well. So if you guys want to do this in real life, uh, and you would actually, you could use uh, Node.js command line applications for doing a lot of like data, uh, data science stuff. Um, so you could create a command line application that cleans up uh, CSV files or Excel files or things like that. Uh, and then, um, you know, converts it to another format, uh, and things like that, then you probably want to get rid of all these kinds of spaces and be able to uh, make everything uh, in the proper uh, format before being able to process through that information or importing it into a database. So I saw a message. Did I lose all of my little widgets? Uh, there it is. Okay. Seems weird that we use, that we type type of data rather than type of data. Yeah. I don't know, JavaScript. <laughs> You're going to be saying that every time you deal with JavaScript. Um, I think for Java and C++, it's type of with the parentheses. I'm not sure. I don't remember. I've been stuck in the JavaScript world so long that I forgot the rest of it. All right. So now we have the append, <clears throat> sorry, the append file. All right, so append file allows us to then append different pieces of information instead of nuking the whole thing. Very similar to write file, but instead, again, instead of us replacing the whole thing, uh, it just appends information to that same file. So let's say that we have a text file that we're getting from uh, the command line. So this is something else that I want to introduce. Um, I know UCLA students, you guys are already going over this, but let's say that we have um, command line arguments that we want to uh, utilize. So to utilize command line arguments, there's actually a global object in Node called process, uh, and there's a method on that called argv. Now, it's actually not a method, it's a property. The property exists as a array, and what happens is this array will automatically store uh, any new uh, argument being passed into the command line uh, if you're using node and uh, attach it as a string into that array. So just push new elements into that string, or sorry, into that array as a string. So to see that, let's take a look at, what is it, number four? No, it's number five.
And if I do node append file JS and I say like, I don't know, meow tuxedo. Or let's just do wolf tuxedo. Let's change things up a bit. Let's go crazy. So we have node append file wolf tuxedo. So based on our logic here, uh, what I said was this will add everything uh, into this process.argv. So why don't we console.log this process.argv and see what that looks like. So if I hit enter, notice that I get an array back. The first uh, element inside of this array is the path to our node uh, module that, sorry, our node package and where it's installed. Uh, the second argument being passed is for the append file.js and the path to that file location. So from my computer, from root, it's users, Omar Patel, blah, 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 and then it goes to the append file.js. All right, now the third argument being, or sorry, the third element in the array is woof, and fourth is tuxedo. Notice the data types of all of these are set as strings. Right, so it automatically stores that as a string, and so if I take a look at the process.argv property, it gives me back all the information that was put into the command line and allows me to use it. So the reason that we have process.argv starting at index two to store our text file, uh, let's say that we wanted to pass a text file into the append file. So remember, before we manually did this, right? We did movies.txt. Now we're dynamically getting input from the end user and being able to put that inside of our method. So why are we using this process.rv2? So UCLA students, don't cheat, but uh, help out uh, others who haven't reached this yet. I'll give you guys about a few minutes to work on this. All right, so on when we did read and um, write, the first argument was a dot text file, right? But um, why why are is process dot arg argv uh, element three? Why is why are we putting that as the first? as a first argument if it's not a, a file. Does anybody know, know about that? He's trying to let us specify the file name so we can just type it in that command line. And whatever we type in is going to be the file name. Oh, OK, cool. So if we put as a first argument, like, uh, dogs.txt, that's just the new name of the file, right? Yeah, we're naming it, right. That's text file. So text file can be any string, basically, that we type in there. Hopefully it's a valid file name. Okay, cool. And then also, I guess, if we run this function multiple times, uh, we're going to, in order to append Hello Kitty into the same one, our first argument is always going to have to be the same uh, file name we created in, as the first argument. So it would always be like uh, cats.txt, and we'd have to put cats.txt every time in order to continue to put Hello Kitty append Hello Kitty to cats.txt. Yep. Cool. Yeah, you guys are definitely getting this. Excellent. So, from here I can get rid of this. Actually, let's keep that on. 
And why don't we actually execute the, the way it's supposed to be? So why don't we say uh, node append file.js and let's put this into a file that makes sense. Hello kitty.js. Um, so if we take a look at the index of arguments uh, inside of an array, the index of node would be at what? It would be index zero. Correct. So since node is at index zero, one is a pen file at JS, and hello kitty is at uh, two, then if we extract this, we can do process.argv2. We use array indexing to access the third element inside of this array, and then store that or reference it inside of this variable called text file. From there, we pass this variable into this append file method. And from there, we're then uh, manually determining what information we want to put into it. Now, we can take this a step further. And we could have made this into a much more dynamic application, where we then take in every argument after uh, index 2. And then what we say is, OK, concatenate this as a string. Um, and then pass it in as an argument. If I ran it twice, will it say hello kitty twice? Yes, it should. So why don't we do that? So if we execute it once, then if we go to hello kitty.js, says hello kitty. We execute it again, and now it says hello kitty. Notice that it appends it directly to the end line, right? So this is important. You probably want to put spaces in between to make it look better. Uh, or set in new line uh, elements and uh, whatever you want to do, etc., etc. So this is much better if you want to append to something and not have to nuke the file uh, over and over. And if I just ran this over and over, notice that it just appends to it. Any questions so far about that? All right. For the bank app. Yes, much more. All right, so... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Now let's do a more complicated one. Uh, and then let's see, Juan asked about going over package.json. Okay, so uh, let me go over let's see, command sort, weather npm, geocode, Let's go over weather npm and then let's go over package.json. And then we can finish it up. So weather npm. Uh, let me just go out of this. So for weather, and this one really confuses me because it makes no sense. All right, so for those of you who are curious, um, this weather.js module is an external node package that utilizes, if you go to weather.js, loading and floating, American internet. It's just freaking horrible. Okay, uh, we go to the npm package for weather.js, and it uses weather.service.msn.com. However, typing this in into the URL, nothing appears. Did some research. Microsoft weather uh, API.
We are writing to notify you that Microsoft Weather API will no longer be available for download and will uh, be discontinued, uh, uh, discontinued as of April 15, 2015. There's also official notice of this on the Microsoft site. And if you try to contact their API, it doesn't work, right? So they're like, all right, it's been retired since April 2016. However, you go to this guy's code. You go to his uh, JavaScript file. So this is his NPM package. So you can make your own NPM packages, and I highly encourage you guys to do so. Um, and he's using weather.service.msn.com. So he wasn't lying. You go to this, and it doesn't work. So he's obviously a wizard, right? Uh, and that's my only explanation. Or uh, maybe has some like you know deal with Microsoft where he's been using it for so long that you know, and so many people use it that uh, he's allowed to have access to it. And I know that it's pretty recent because he committed to this 19 days ago. So, and it still works. So it's still kind of trivial to me. But this is a very unique situation. Just thought that was uh, pretty interesting. All right, so if we go to the uh, weather JS, uh, you have this var weather equals require weather JS. Now, this is an external node package. And what did I say about external node packages that separate them from internal node packages? Yeah, you need to install them, right? So if I wanted to start using it, and over here I already have it installed, right? Uh, if I go to 0.3, um, actually, let me just do this. Let me try running node weather JS. Yeah, it's going to work because I still have it installed um, in, uh, in an upper folder. Um, but for you guys, if you were to run this, uh, then it would run into an error and it would say, hey, I'm not able to run this. What I have to do is I have to type in npm install and then the name of the uh, weather.js module. So uh, the first thing I did was I found, well, this was given to us, but if you wanted to find modules, you just go to npm and npm is a node package manager. There's also another one called Yarn that Facebook just came out with uh, a few months back. Um, but NPM is still, you know, very uh, widely used. So you just find packages on here, right? So if I wanted to find something for weather, um, you know, there's plenty of them. Weather.js is huge. It's like the second, uh, the second hit. Uh, does it say how many people downloaded it? Oh yeah, so 1,500 downloads in the last month. So it's pretty big, right? Uh, 32 downloads in the last day. Uh, decent amount of people use it. So uh, to install it, all you have to type in is npm install weather.js. Wait for this to finish, hit ls. Um, and you'll see weather.js and nothing else. You'll be like, uh, okay, I don't know what just happened, but I guess I have the ability to use it. So you actually did install this uh, locally, and um, you have the ability to start using it. Now, normally it would show up in my node modules, but um, I don't actually have a node modules folder inside of this directory. Uh, it's somewhere in an upper directory. So if I went up here, do, 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 do. Here we go. So it went all the way up and found this node modules directory. So the way that it actually looks for node modules, it will actually go up and determine if you have it, uh, uh, like a node module folder, and it'll just install it there. Uh, so let's see, if I ls node modules, I'm sure I have it in there somewhere. Uh, Weather.js, yep. So it's installed in there. So I'm just gonna go back down. Um, and you want to install this only uh, in the directory where you're using it. So make sure that you're not in a subdirectory when installing things. Uh, make sure you're in the, in the proper project directory whenever you're installing uh, any external node packages. And we're going to get into using package.json 
to help you manage dependencies as well. Um, so if I go back to class content, 10.3, activities, uh, and if I go back to 0 0.03, blah, blah, blah. So now if I hit node weather JS, I mean, it was working before, but uh, that's because I had it pre-installed. Um, so what this does is it makes an API call to the uh, MSN weather uh, API that supposedly doesn't work, but works for this guy. Um, and it returns all this information back in uh, JSON format, right? So you guys uh, in the UT Houston uh, cohort are going to be working with APIs uh, heavily in week six, uh, and you're going to be making asynchronous calls uh, from the front end using AJAX. Uh, and AJAX is asynchronous JavaScript and XML, and you're going to be doing that uh, using the jQuery uh, AJAX method. And it's going to be uh, fairly simplistic to actually do this because it only involves a few lines of code similar to how this only involves a few lines of code. This is actually a little bit more complicated uh, than I think Ajax is. Because Ajax, you just pass it a couple things and it returns all this information. Uh, but no notice, uh, you'll notice that it's a little bit, well, actually I think it's a lot faster. Um, and one of the reasons is it's running directly on the V8 engine and it doesn't have a browser to deal with when making these calls. So it doesn't have all that fluff. So as soon as I pass in this object, which contains a search, uh, and I can just search based on a predefined string of Anchorage, Alaska, which no one cares about, uh, and the second argument uh, being a property value of degree type Fahrenheit, then what happens is I get that callback with the result and the error, of course, right? So error first and callbacks. If there is no error, then we're going to do something called uh, json.stringify. So now... So uh, what you need to do is uh, you need to stringify every piece of information in order to display it uh, on your screen. Now, this is just a way to make things look really nice on the screen, right? So let's say that you have, um, let's say you have an object and you want to make it look uh, a certain way. Well, json.stringify allows you to do that. So if I just did JSON, or let's just say I console.log the result without doing a JSON.stringify. I could do console.dir. Well, first let's do console.log, and let's see what that looks like. Notice that I get back the information, but some of it just says object, 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 right? It doesn't really go deep into it. Now, I could do console.dir. Oh, and it still doesn't go directly into these objects. So if I want to go into nested objects and display all the information inside of there, then what I do is I have to stringify it. So I do stringify. And what this does is it takes um, JavaScript and uh, converts it into uh, a string and then formats it however you want. So the first argument is going to be the object that you want to pass in. The second argument is um, another function that could further do some crazy uh, processing on it if you want. So we're just going to set that to null because we don't want to do that. Uh, and the third argument is going to be uh, how many spaces that you want uh, inside of your object that you're uh, passing in. So if you want it to display with two spaces uh, across the board, then you hit two, and oh, I didn't finish this completely, so checking my syntax, and it displays with two spaces. So two spaces here, two spaces, two spaces, two spaces. Um, let's see, now if I have four, so some people for, uh, prefer four. I'm just going to do four. And notice that you see four spaces over here. All right. Just eyeballing it, you can see about four spaces. Uh, any questions about that? So, five. All right.
Yeah, so if you don't have a node modules folder, it'll show up uh, as dependencies and node modules. Um, starting with, um, you'll also see all the dependencies listed in there. So you, you might see a whole bunch of dependencies in there. Don't worry about that. Dependencies are essentially just uh, node modules that uh, require other node modules. So you're gonna have to install all the other node modules that that node module is based on if it required any. And node modules, again, are just uh, libraries or packages that exist that help you uh, create code uh, or help you use code that's pre-existing, similar to APIs, right? Um, what you do is you just say, oh, okay, um, I want to use someone else. And they are APIs, by the way. Uh, if I want to use someone else's uh, code um, that, and I don't want to build it myself, like they have a piece of functionality, like weather, uh, what I do is I just use weather.find or the weather.js package and it uses uh, MSN's, you know, blah, 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 uh, you know, API, and uh, I can just pass it some simple information and takes care of that thing for me, then why not use that? Again, uh, try and be lazy as programmers. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. Use other people's programs. Um, it's not just because it's easier. It's also because if it's a package that has a lot of downloads, uh, likely, um, it has been vetted thoroughly, meaning that uh, it's gone through a lot of testing, a lot of people used it, a lot of people put patches through it, um, it works really well, assumably, uh, then rather than if you did something from scratch. All right. Um, so package.json. So here we have this application called weather destination.js, right? So this one is a huge file, and it has multiple uh, external node or sorry, external node packages being uh, utilized. So this is, I think, using two node packages, GeoCoder and Weather. So if you go into this application, so let's go into zero five. Notice that we have package.json. Uh, node modules and another zip file. Don't worry about the zip file. Uh, let's take a look at weather destination.js. So um, this weather desk.js, uh, first what it does is it takes in all the command line arguments. <clears throat> so again, process.argv is going to be a property of the process global object that's going to contain uh, or that contains an array of all the arguments being passed to it from the command line. Um, from here, we're setting an address, we're initializing it to an empty string, uh, and we start a for loop from uh, the second index. Uh, so why do we start this at two if we're going through node args.length? Yes, process, well, process is global uh, as an object, and argv is a method of that global object. So yeah, it is global in Node. Similar to how window is uh, global to the browser. Yes, yeah, so we're doing uh, the for loop starting at two because we wanna ignore the node and the file name uh, paths, right? So the only arguments that we really care about are the ones passed to it after that, right? So we started at two, we go through this, and again, a different way to do it, you can use splice, slice, um, you can extract it that way, you don't have to use a for loop. Um, and you could just save that into uh, node args. That's fine too. Uh, so what happens here is um, <clears throat> you're taking all the node arguments um, and you're just building a string with the address, right? So you're saying, okay, someone passed in all this information and all we're doing is concatenating that information with spaces into a variable called address. So if I put in one, two, three, four, Sesame Street, C Avenue, right? Uh, Brooklyn, whatever. Now, if I want to console.log, address uh, 
notice that it, it's just giving me an error because it what I did makes no sense. Um, one, two, three, four, Sesame Street is not real. Uh, sorry to disappoint anyone. But it gave me back the information uh, that I pasted in here uh, as arguments as a single string. So this string is just passed back to me in the console.log. And that's what I created over here. I just said, okay, give it to me one at a time. Um, give me the, the parts of the argument one at a time and uh, combine them with spaces. So just simple uh, string concatenation. Uh, so now we can get rid of this. And so far, everything is very synchronous, right? All these are synchronous calls. There's no asynchronicity yet until we get here. So now we have Geocoder. So Geocoder is another package that's actually built off of uh, Google Maps. Uh, I think it's actually, yeah, it's part of Google Maps uh, Geocoder API. So what this does is it takes the method, um,